Dear students, uh, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Diplomatic Academy for tonight's uh, event. Uh, it is something very special because we very often talk about geopolitics and what it means in world politics, but we hardly ever talk about uh, geopolitics. We hardly ever talk whether there is a theory behind talking about geopolitics and what it means for international relations. Uh, and uh, when we heard that there is uh, one person who's just finished two years ago uh, a, a collection of books starting a series uh, on the theories, methods, and concepts of geopolitics, we asked him to come to Vienna. And I'm very happy that David Krikemans agreed to Thank come you. here. Welcome. Thank you so, so much. Uh, the discussion is moderated by our Professor Müller, who is known to the, to the students here, and I guess also to the rest of, the, uh, of, of, of tonight's uh, party. Well, I'm not saying much for the introduction, I'm just saying that uh, it is obvious that no day at the moment goes by without someone talking about geopolitics and the consequences for uh, our international relations, uh, and uh, the Ukraine is just just another example uh, of what it might mean. And uh, when you look into uh, the consequences of this war from uh, discussions about prices, about natural resources, but also to the, the fact whether it's a multipolar world or not, uh, to the question whether Russia is one of those geopolitical actors which is, is trying to create his, his zones of influence again, uh, this is a very obvious thing. But what's less obvious is the fact, uh, is it worth discussing it in academic terms, uh, uh, thinking about this. Here at the Diplomatic Academy, we started about a year ago a series on big rivers in international politics. Uh, and when you come to think about it, this was a geopolitical approach that we uh, framed the story about how the Nile issues or the issues of the Mekong uh, the Delta uh, influence uh, the world politics, national politics, world politics, regional politics uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, it's obvious. Uh, still, I, am, uh, I have to listen to what we hear tonight to be convinced that it is already uh, not only uh, uh, an interesting notion that we live in geopolitical times, but that there is a way for international relations to do serious research on it. Where are the, the, the avenues one should follow? What is about geoeconomics? What is about critical geography? Uh, how do you describe actually what you're talking about? Because the fact that territories matters is as old, I guess, uh, as international re relations are. Uh, and I could give you hundreds of Austrian examples where you could say it's geopolitical that South Tyrol is not part of Austria or that Burgenland is part of Austria. Uh, so we need a little bit more than just saying it's territorially uh, variables that, that can be, that can be uh, done research on. Uh, and finally, as a diplomat, uh, as an Austrian diplomat, I'm certainly interested, what is the relationship between what you are doing academically and the real foreign policy issues that we have at hand? How can it be helpful on, on issues that we have to solve? What does it mean for the Austrian discussion about security, about neutrality, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, um, uh, whether it's, it's really a, a, a battle of values, uh, as the Russians say, and also the West is saying now. What is the position now that we should take in, on the transatlantic relationship in, in such a change of geopolitical discussions? So it, very, it could be very valuable, I'm very cautious here to say, uh, also for foreign policy issues around the globe. Uh, and uh, that's why I'm happy that you agreed to come here. Uh, and my final word is because uh, this is a place where we talk a lot about also climate change and uh, environmental issues. I know that you also uh, have in mind that geopolitical thinking can help us uh, mm -hmm. on these environmental issues and how we how we work on them in, 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 in politics. Uh, and I think uh, Having said all this, I hope I did not ask uh, too much of you to tell us whether there is a real geographical consciousness now mm. or whether this is just, just another idea of people who, who want to work in international relations. So I'm much, much looking forward and, and I apologize for being so critical at the very introduction of this evening. Welcome again. From Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you so much, Ambassador Briggs, and also from my side, uh, a very warm welcome. Um, I would like to start with the French poet uh, Victor Hugo, who once said that uh, famously, nothing is more powerful um, than an idea whose time has come. And uh, I think uh, probably also nothing is more timely than writing a book now about geopolitics. But I think it's fair to say that our guest um, here today is not somebody who is just riding a wave of geopolitics. Um, but uh, you have already written, uh, as we already talked, know your PhD about the subject. So it's uh, really somebody who thinks since a long time and very deep um, about those issues. Um, and also in our conversation, I had uh, the feeling that you kind of um, are almost a bit missionary about it in the sense now that quite a few of your PhDs are written also on geopolitics. So mm -hmm. you must also have a pull uh, on students um, to attract students who, who, who also think, you know, this is very relevant to work on. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward. I would like to say a few words about you for those who probably haven't read um, your impressive CV. So you did your PhD in, in Antwerp now in 2005, and now you're an associate a professor at this institution. Uh, and you're also very um, much um, linked to other places, very much uh, embedded, uh, Utrecht University, Geneva Institute for Geopolitical Studies, um, Roman Lull University in Barcelona. I also saw that you write on sub-state diplomacy. You know, I spent some time in the Basque Country, so big issue there as well. So, um, yeah. Um, but uh, without much further ado, we, we very much look forward to your talk and then, of course, to interesting discussions. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you so much. Um, I'll uh, take, uh, go over there, so it's a bit easier for me to uh, um, to address you, uh, Ambassador Briggs. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation, Professor Müller. Uh, dear students, uh, thank you. Um, well, I'm I'm actually here because of this book, of course, uh, Geopolitics and International Relations. It already states it a little bit in the title, Grounding World Politics Anew. And the grounding is a hint not only to the territory and territorially embedded factors, but also uh, discussing theory and theories of international relations, theories of geopolitics. And it is indeed uh, part of a broader initiative uh, that I myself and some colleagues, which I should mention, uh, Professor Julak Surgai, uh, director of the Geneva Institute of Geopolitical Studies, um, have taken already for many years, since 2005, uh, through a summer course, um, to uh, work together. So in that sense, to create a network of scholars in Europe, mostly, um, uh, to discuss uh, geopolitics and, uh, and geopolitical analysis. Of course, we... Uh, the ambassador has already stated we, we are uh, living in um, yeah, quite uh, difficult times. Uh, the world is still recovering uh, uh, from a pandemic uh, where we learned how dependent we are, we are and were uh, about, uh, uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, supply chain issues were an issue, uh, but of course the rise of China and how to deal uh, with that also from a European point of view, the One Belt, One Road initiative. The crisis with Russia, it's difficult to look uh, away, the war in Russia, the serious consequences it might have for the East-West relations for many years to come, the energy transition and the climate change, a food security issue. These are all relevant topics one could study uh, from a geopolitical point of view. But indeed, the question is then, what is geopolitics? What does it all mean? And let me start by saying that actually, quite interesting, geopolitics as a field is 20 years older than the field of international relations. International relations, as you all know, started in 1919 as a field with a mission try to study the conditions of international relations to try to avoid war. Aberystwyth, Geneva, also this institution and many others to study international relations. But of course there may, were many others before 1919 who studied international relations. Diplomats, for instance, historians, legal scholars, in international law. They studied also the international 
uh, condition. And geopolitics rose as a field, if you will, at the end of the 19th century. And this was not a coincidence. Why was it not a coincidence? Because it is a world, it was a world which was closing in upon itself. The European powers were had um, spheres of influence, were racing for access to natural resources. Um, there was an increasing struggle and a struggle overseas, for instance in Africa after 1885 in the conference in Vienna could have immediate implications on the power balance, balance of power in Europe. And it is a Swedish scholar actually, quite interestingly, and he was influenced by a political geographer, for instance, Friedrich Gratzel in Germany, but he was also influenced by others who came up with this approach, geopolitics, as part of what he called an organic political sciences, which would study sociology, the legal aspects, the eco-politic or the economics, if you will, the geo-economic dimension, and there it was, geopolitics, the state is more than the sum of its constitutional articles. The state was, and this was influenced by uh, Ratzel, was a kind of living being in a struggle with other entities. And this was actually influenced by Darwin and social Darwin. So there is this social Darwinistic idea of struggle. Actually, you also see it somewhat later in the uh, theoretical approach of realism. There we also see struggle and, and power struggle. But much to uh, what you might not suspect, geopolitics was founded actually as a field to try to avoid conflict. So to study the conditions of international relations and what it also uh, was uh, important was location, um, physical geography, so mountains, access to the sea, human geography, groups of people. Today, if you study Iraq, you need to know that there are Sunnis, Shiites, um, Kurds, and the complexities of the situation on the ground, and also the spatial dimension. These were uh, some variables that were crucial in this initial initial attempt to study the state as a territorial entity. And when I started in, uh, in, in, in the 1990s, people were saying, David, what are you doing? Geopolitics, that's the 19th century, it's no longer relevant. Um, the world is going to become one, the Cold War has been won, Europe is going to become one, these geopolitical factors. Are they really relevant? Um, and I understood only later that, of course, my colleagues were reflecting at that particular moment in time, the consensus in mainstream international relations, that indeed ter territory could be overcome uh, through technology, for instance. Um, that's only one issue. Uh, but also uh, through alliances or uh, through that new world that was being built in the 1990s. And indeed, uh, you might know uh, Robert Kaplan, who is actually uh, well, he's a journalist, also a bit of a historian, a world traveler. He's talking about the revenge of geography. We've somewhat tucked away these territorial factors, at least in mainstream IR, some have, and perhaps they're back, they're, there is a revenge. We, want, we do, didn't want to talk about spheres of influence in the West, and now you have this Russian entity, which is uh, actually because of, perhaps because we did not use the chance, that unique chance of the 1990s to create a, a pan-European security architecture to bring Russia close to Europe and the United States, because perhaps we missed that opportunity. Um, now Russia has created its alternative reality, if you will, and we're back, we're back in a kind of Cold War 2.0 uh, situation. 
So in geopolitics, differs a bit from IR in the sense that we believe that territorially embedded, embedded factors are still relevant. But also in the geop many geopolitical scholars, they try to paint a holistic picture of what is going on. And this is perhaps also in other fields, also in IR, we try to know more and more about less and less. Whereas in geopolitics, we try to understand how a geoeconomic situation, or for instance, the, men the mental maps of the Russians, affect, for instance, their geostrategic calculus. So in that sense, you could say that geoeconomics, geopolitics, geostrategy, these are not separate compartments. You need to look at them together to try to create that holistic picture. And of course, there it becomes rather, well, rather difficult, of course, because it all depends on the theoretical perspectives which you then develop, what kind of a picture you would see. And perhaps also, I'm a Belgian, so I, I'm, I'm looking at, with Belgi whether I like it or not, I'm looking at Belgian eyes. You are looking at the world with Austrian eyes. Um, we need, of course, many different sets of eyes. We need different perspectives, different theoretical approaches to try to understand uh, the world today. And that is a little bit what this book also tries to do, to, uh, give the comp to, to analyze the, the variables of geopolitical analysis, but also to give a kind of overview of the schools of thought. And when I was, actually, my original topic was the borders of Europe, but then I discovered that I needed to do geopolitics because the literature has been scattered. The French literature, the German literature, the Italian literature, the Anglo-Saxon literature, you find it scattered over many different books and they have different interpretations on these schools of thought. And what are these schools of thought? Just as a short teaser, there is, of course, the classical geopolitical thinking, which looks in a very traditional way uh, to location, resources, spheres of influence. Um, Alfred Thayer Mahon might ring a bell, the sea power theory, which actually influenced uh, the European struggle. Think about Wilhelm II and the British. The uh, naval struggle was lit directly influenced also by the thinking of, um, of Mahon. Wilhelm II boasted that on all, on all his ships there was a copy of the sea uh, the, the, the book of uh, Alfred Thayer Mahon, and my officers are using the book in a very acute way. Uh, but of course, um, part of that run-up to the First World War is the naval struggle, which of course also affected Japan and the United States. So this is only one example. You might have heard about Halford, John Mackinder, the land power theory, the heartland theory that also has certain spin-offs in today's world. When I'm trying to understand the current situation in Russia, I'm now forced to look at neo-Eurasianism. Groups of scholars, Alexander Dugin is one of them, um, sometimes difficult to understand Russian thinking, but they are implicitly or explicitly referring to this heartland uh, theory, the idea that perhaps a systemic crisis is needed to create a new, bigger geopolitical unit, and perhaps we can discuss later on uh, the Ukraine crisis, because uh, it was mentioned even a few days after the invasion. There's, there was a French uh, school of thought, ladies and gentlemen, in uh, the 1920s and the 1930s called possibilism. And they believed that territorially embedded factors offered opportunities, but also disadvantages. And good statementship is try to manage those. Maximize the opportunities of location, resources, supply lines, one would say today. Minimize the downsides. Develop a strategy so much more human agency there. Whereas in Germany in the 1930s and 40s, because of course, because of Versailles, they felt betrayed. The, some 
went to geopolitics as if it would explain everything. Eh? Of course, Germany had a predicament, the Mittellage, eh? the middle position in Europe, and how to deal with that. And some believed, Haushofer and others, that geopolitics was going to save them. And so you see a whole debate that also became a taboo, by the way, because some, as Haushofer, went too close to the Nazi political party. But geopolitics never went away after the Second World War. Um, some of the real geopolitical scholars in Germany, Alfred Wolfers, for instance, Arnold Wolfers, for instance, ended up in the United States together with Nicholas Spikeman. They worked on uh, realism, but also with geopolitical factors there. And um, after the Second World War, there were, for instance, Harold and Margaret Sprout, and they worked on mental maps, cognitive behavioralism, they called it. They said, if you want to understand uh, decisions in foreign policy, the material factors as such may play a role, but actually, how are they perceived, the mental maps, the perception by key decision makers in international relations, and how does that fit into uh, political decisions. And today, you might know the school of thought of critical geopolitics, the discourse analysis, part of constructivism, if you believe, where uh, discourse is studied, and how through discourse, politicians, policy-relevant people, attribute meaning to events. Uh, for instance, 9-11, is it terrorism, or it could have been also, um, well, uh, 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 it could have been looked at an, from another point of view. Terrorism was then located in Afghanistan. It was ter re-territorialized, if you will. The boundaries for, ter for uh, these theories, one of my PhD students, you, uh, you mentioned him implicitly, Antonios <laughs> Nestoras, he's saying, well, actually, the discourse as such also affects material reality and the other way around. For instance, uh, his PhD was on why did Greece choose for the West? It could also have chosen for the East. And the choices that were made politically and in society also affected material reality. So in that sense, ladies and gentlemen, just that was your teaser, to say that there is a wide variety of schools of thought that directly or indirectly have links to international relations. And I believe in scientific realism in the sense that we can use different approaches and perspectives to try to understand aspects of reality. Because ter territory or territorially embedded factors manifest themselves in different ways at the same time, in a material way, in how it is perceived, but also in discourse. And we as scholars, of course, and that's the mission of scholars, try to use these different perspectives to try to understand that. And that may also have policy implications. Yeah? Um, but of course, our mission is a little bit uh, different compared to the practitioners. Nevertheless, we can learn from each other, and also uh, academic work can uh, influence uh, policy making and the other way around. And then to more or less conclude, or, or just to give you a kind of um, idea of about one particular chapter that I thought was also relevant to briefly uh, address this evening, one of my chapters next to the theoretical chapter is about technology and geopolitics, because we often forget that even the classical authors in geopolitics often implicitly talked about new technologies and how their introduction, new technologies in terms of production, transportation, um, etc., how these technologies could affect world uh, politics, eh? the railways, this was Mackinder. The introduction of railways in Eurasia would create a kind of the potential for a power hub, meaning the heartland, at, this is Russia. Eh? And, and did, this would also have policy implications for uh, the British in the Far East 
And he even predicted, by the way, he was sent by the British government uh, after uh, he was part of Versailles. He was part of the negotiations. He was completely fed up with Versailles after that. He wrote a book, title of the book, Democratic Ideals and Reality. So ideals and reality already in that book in which he predicted that the geopolitical balance of power um, was still unstable after Versailles. He, he proposed a, a, a network of buffer states because otherwise the geopolitical balance in Europe would not be, uh, would not be um, solved. Sea power theories, Mahan, I've mentioned, but today we could even apply, some scholars are trying to do that, to the cyber domain. That is perhaps also a domain. Some even are saying, well, the geostationary locations for satellites over the planet, those are also who controls those uh, positions. And today will probably be Elon Musk um, as a non-state actor. Well, he, that's also a power position. So in that sense, uh, technology and geopolitics has been relevant in the past and is relevant today. Just a few examples. I'm working, I'm, I'm working a lot these days on energy and energy transition, and this is relevant because we have now this crisis with Ukraine. And we European countries, at least the European Commission, has formulated this ambition. Uh, we're going to downsize for, downsize for two-thirds our gas and oil consumption from Russia. Good luck. Uh, we'll see whether we get there. But, of course, you need an energy diversification strategy. And you need to think about it in a clever way. And also, we tend to forget, of course, that uh, if we talk about energy transition, it's not a world without resources. Eh? We're going to need lithium. We're going to need cobalt. We're going to need nickel. By the way, uh, now with the sanctions, we, we will not get access to the, sh the cheapest nickel in the world, which is Norilsk nickel. But by the way, just between us, it also has some serious environmental consequences if you look at how Nor Norilsk nickel is, uh, is mining it. The cobalt market... 60-65% in the hands of China. The Congo plays an important role. So the point that I want to make is, of course, that as this energy transition is now going to be upscaled, it will have geopolitical implications. We will have to think this through in terms of our foreign policies and our diplomatic relations. For the moment, the European Commission has studied these matters, but we have not yet implemented. There are some examples. For instance, Germany has a direct has, um, relations with Bolivia now, with regard to lithium, for instance. It's just one example. But we will have to think this through quite quickly also in terms of diversification strategies. And, of course, new technologies, for instance, with regard to... Um, the storage of renewable energy, if there's a breakthrough there, that may, ch may change the picture again. So I, as a geopolitical scholar, now need to talk with technological specialists to try to understand, okay, what are the implications in terms of resources or supply routes, for instance, yeah? because uh, we need to work together. Another, and then I'm, then I'm wrapping up because I'm taking too much time, but it's a little bit my bridge to current events, security matters. Ladies and gentlemen, new technologies. For instance, the drone technology, the Turkish drones uh, that have been used by Ukraine, and by the way, it was mentioned by the OSCE already in October 2021 that Ukraine used Turkish drones on the contact line with Donetsk Luhansk point that I want to make, and of course you've seen all in the media how drones are now playing a role also in, in the security situation. So new technologies may change the strategic calculus of other actors. And we need to take that also in account, not only as scholars, but also military are uh, taking that in, into account. 
might perhaps we have missed that Moscow then has drawn some conclusions from the introduction of those technologies with regard to what their strategic security situation could be horizon four to five years, eh? because the Ukrainian army was modernizing. So in that sense, I, 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 and, and I'll more or less stop here, to say that indeed also technology in geopolitics is important, and just if we look at Ukraine, you could also look at other factors, location, Ukraine literally means borderland, where spheres of influence meet one another. You could look at physical geography, it's an open plain. So it's difficult to defend, and that's also one of the reasons why in the historical past, Russia wanted that buffer zone. You could look at human geography, the, the eight million Russian speakers in the East, now a lot of them are also against Putin because uh, the Russian army destroyed their homes, of course. But nevertheless, it will be important to think how in a new future, if let's say in the scenario that Ukraine can somehow be, huh, what will the position be of the Russian speakers, of the minorities? So the point that I want to make is that I think that uh, territorially embedded factors are still quite relevant, that there are different approaches, different theoretical schools of thought. They were all products of their own time period, so we have to look at it in a critical way, but they offer us tools in the toolbox. And as a, to end as a, with a kind of joke, my last chapter in the book is Geopolitics and International Relations, From Living Apart Together, to friends with benefits, in the sense that I think geopolitics and IR each have each other a lot to offer. And um, that is the academic mission, to learn from each other. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kriegemans, for this uh, you know, very extensive terrain also that you had to cover now that basically material factors stretch from, from nickel supply to, um, um, you know, expanding geopolitics up in space, basically. Um, and then, of course, there are all these more um, psychological uh, factors. You know, yeah. How do we see the world? How do we map the world? So it's really a very, very vast field um, that allows for many questions. And I have many questions on my list, but I will definitely um, not um, abuse my role and go first. And I have also a list of students that makes me um, imagine that there will be many more questions. So I would like to um, open the my floor pleasure. with this um, anticipation. Um, and uh, please, when you, when you um, state your questions, also say very briefly who you are and maybe the program you're in or your affiliation so that our guest also has the opportunity to, yeah. to get to know you. Thank you so much. Um, good. Um, Benedict has the mic, so um, please don't be deterred by the mic, and whoever has a question, um, please let us know. Wonderful. Yeah. I have for the beginning two questions. Certainly geopolitics is fascinating. Can you tell me who of these nice geopoliticians foresaw the attack of Russia against Ukraine? Was there anybody? I know that the American CIA apparently knew it. Probably they were the only one. Maybe there are some geopoliticians, but uh, this was not mentioned in the newspapers, but uh, maybe you know whether there was anybody who knew it. Could you briefly also state who you are so that we uh, okay. get an answer? My name is uh, Santner and I'm pensioner. <laughs> Wonderful. You see that you know, we always start here with the easy questions. So, so. I was no formerly in the uh, German economic ministry mm -hmm. responsible for energy issues. So mm -hmm. present situation is particularly fascinating for me. Okay, so much for me, to me. So my first question was that, I don't repeat it. My second question is, is there, you spoke of material factors 
and also mental factors. Mm -hmm. One mental factor would be, to put it quite clearly, stupidity. Do you say in your book that since 1990, only to speak of the period of after 1990, there were a number of stupidities. I mention only four. There was the Iraq war as a stupidity. There was the Afghanistan war, a stupidity. There was Syria as a stupidity. There was Libya as a stupidity. Do you in your book quite clearly say that the West in 1990 was more or less in a brilliant situation, but due to the stupidities which were made by the West, we are in the mess where we are now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Would, would you like to collect uh, uh, questions, or is this uh, already enough uh, for stupidities uh, well, and uh, well, well, uh, I, I, questions? I can work with this. Yes. I can work with this. Uh, who foresaw? Actually, there were already my uh, colleague, colleague uh, Julak Surgai, from who is director, by the way, of the Geneva Institute of Geopolitical Studies. He quite recently uh, sent me an article of his more than 10 years ago. Uh, in the sense that um, there were, if and, and there were also French uh, geopolitical scholars, who stated that in the end uh, Ukraine might rupture, so that uh, an east or west, east and west Ukraine, uh, would be the most likely scenario. And of course, we are dealing with the future, ladies and gentlemen. We, we're not fortune tellers. We're analysts and we're looking at the different variables. And of course, we must be very careful, and that's one of the lessons of classical geopolitics, not to end up in geographical determinism. So we analyze, but of course there's still human agency. So if the point that I want to make is that if an inclusive Ukraine, an inclusive, you, you remember that in the Minsk II agreements, for instance, they were never into implemented, of course, but it, uh, one of the uh, provisions uh, was also a revision of the Constitution. It was also about uh, dealing with minorities, and this has been instrumentalized by the Russian Federation. Eh? Donetsk, Lugansk, they were eh? uh, so-called in danger, etc. But the point that I want to make is that, well, we never completely know. We are dealing here in this particular issue that you talk about with a uh, analysis about the future, so we deal with uncertainties. We can only develop scenarios. But my colleague, Julek Surgai, has been one that, uh, who actually wrote that this was, in his opinion, and then that was 10 years ago, the more likely scenario. So there were, there were scholars. Um, with regard to um, your second question, Actually, um, this is a collective effort, by the way, and, and the nucleus of the authors are my, or my colleagues at the Geneva Institute of Geopolitical Studies. Um, one of the authors is Alexandre Lambert, who is actually the vice director of the Geneva Institute, and he writes about um, uh, NATO enlargement, but also the kind of, what he believes is that canon has been misinterpreted by, by the Americans themselves after, uh, this, well, let's say from the 1990s onwards. And that mistakes were made, that, and this is often mentioned these days, uh, and you always have to be careful when you mention that. Uh, it's not that you uh, are, are then supporting the Russian position, but of course there was this unique opportunity in the 1990s to create a kind of pan-European security architecture, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer, to create, a, and the OSCE perhaps could have been a kind of nucleus around which um, that security architecture could have been created, eh? nobody really knows. In the end, NATO won, eh? and, and, and NATO expanded. Eh? But, um, it, the point that I want to make is that indeed uh, Alexandre Lambert talks about 
uh, canon, this misinterpretation of canon, uh, the misperceptions that we had, and perhaps also the Russian misperceptions about the West. We find ourselves now in a war. It's only about the war, the war logic. Uh, I'm a bit concerned about that in terms also of uh, escalation. Um, but I think that some lessons from a geopolitical analysis is that also we, and this has certain policy implications, we should also keep in mind what are our goals as Western countries? Mm. What kind of a future Ukraine are we now talking about? Eh? Because the goals keep on shifting. And uh, Lloyd Austin, the uh, Secretary of uh, Defense this week, said in, uh, in, in Germany, well, uh, the goal is uh, that Russia must be weakened so that it can never act in such a way in the future. So it comes very close to kind of regime change or uh, trying to think away Russia. Perhaps as an American you can do that, but as a European it's much more difficult. So um, we have to deal, we have to learn from the past, we have to de deal with those issues. And what I often find is that, uh, you mentioned Iraq, Afghanistan, it's often about misperceptions. And sometimes even Jervis, for our students, Jervis wrote a book on uh, perception and misperception in, uh, in 1971. He well, sometimes, sometimes our politicians deliberately misperceive reality for their political agenda. And that's perhaps interesting how um, there is a political agenda and how the perception of the geopolitical reality becomes a function of that political agenda. And in a healthy democracy, we should also Try to, I'm trying to do that, I'm not, so, I'm not so successful, by the way, these days on Ukraine in the Belgian political debate, but it's still important to challenge uh, these perceptions, um, uh, because then you can come to uh, more achievable uh, political goals in the end. Wonderful. And uh, I think also it's probably fair to say in the stupidities that you outlined, no, also um, very good advice has been ignored or or, or sidelined now and some of it as you mentioned came from scholars of, of geopolitics but I have a lot of sympathy for your phrasing of, mm. of those um, events good let's have uh, some more questions um, yeah well it's very almost you know everybody at the same time so I think quite flexibly um, hi, hello, my name is Alexandra Messner. I come from Luxembourg and I'm a MICE 2 student. Uh, thank you for your holistic view on world politics. I have a bit more of a region-specific question, namely about the Western Balkans. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that EU enlargement is the only way to create lasting peace in the area? And because you mentioned uh, China's massive share of the cobalt uh, resources of this planet, how do you evaluate the um, influence of China on the Western Balkans? And um, do you think it poses a bigger threat to Western ideas uh, as opposed to Russia's influence on the area? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I I do let's have some more questions. Yeah, some more questions, yes. okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Ellie, I'm also a MICE II student. Um, and I wanted to know what, in your opinion, is the role of international organizations in the mm -hmm. current political atmosphere? You mentioned the role of tech and non-state actors. Do you think that the United Nations and its organs, are have they outlived their geopolitical utility? Mm -hmm. Okay, one more and then that's... Uh, that's okay. uh, hello, I'm Pia, I'm also my two students. Um, and I'm wondering what you think of values, what kind of role those play in the current situation? and if they should play a bigger role considering how Europe is acting in conflicts today. When you look at China and Taiwan, for example, and Ukraine, on the other hand, why aren't we more engaged in Taiwan and Hong Kong, but always claim that we are engaged in Ukraine because of our values? Do you think we should change this somehow and this should be a bigger um, way of thinking about why we are acting in certain conflicts? Because conflicts are 
kind of emerging more and more due to different perceptions and different values in the world. That's what I'm kind of taking from the current situation. Yeah, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. All right. So let's give you a chance to, to answer and then we collect the other questions. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, Alexander, your, your first question. I do not consider myself, uh, you cannot be an expert in everything, but luckily I have colleagues. Uh, we're going to have a book on, um, on the Western Balkans and the external geopolitical influence on the Western Balkans. Uh, Arlena Rustemi and the team of uh, Rob de Wijk, the Hague Center for Strategic Studies, are currently uh, reworking a study that they already did, by the way, into a book with a very interesting also methodology. Yeah, the Western Balkans, ladies and gentlemen, is, um, is, is, is difficult. Uh, I know that for Austria it's uh, important also uh, in terms of the, the foreign policy. Um, uh, countries such as Slovenia in the past that have also uh, placed it on the, on the EU agenda. It is not an easy one. Um, I think we are often r rather in a simplistic way looking at the Western Balkans. Um, nevertheless, it is a meeting place in the sense that it's on not only the Chinese, but also uh, Saudi Arabia, for instance. Eh? There are also... Uh, many other external actors uh, who are interested. And it's not only geopolitical, it's also geoeconomic. There are investments made. The energy dimension plays a role, uh, pipelines. There might even be, again, a geostrategic dimension. I don't know whether you saw, but the Chinese uh, flew in. Uh, some anti-aircraft uh, uh, missile systems a few weeks ago. Um, so, in that sense, um, it is rather complex. Um, is enlargement or a perspective to enlarge? I believe that a country such as Serbia, I saw a few days ago that Serbia has flipped again in terms of uh, potential EU membership, so the public opinion. So, that might already be changing. If you look at the broad, but then, you, then I'm using more a policy perspective, so if, if I would be a policy practitioner sitting in, 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 in Brussels, it is of course worrying that in this European sphere, if you will, that on the territory of this European neighborhood, there are all kinds of external actors vying for influence. Uh, so in that sense, um, uh, there are also alternatives uh, for instance, super association status in the sense of access to the internal market. I believe a lot in cultural diplomacy, academic diplomacy, so the human dimension, the human security dimension also, that may or may not in the end end up into membership, but I think we should look at it from a much more complex point of view. Um, membership also entails responsibilities, as you might know. The European integration is 35 chapters that need to be negotiated. It's 100,000 pages of legislation that need to be implemented. So it changes, by the way, societies from the inside out, and some of these countries, perhaps even the Ukraine, even Ukraine, might perhaps not anticipate that. And is that what they really want? So I more believe in a kind of pragmatic approach where there is that possibility. So instead of zero and one membership or no membership. It's more about a trajectory to work together more, to have human uh, uh, students from the region, exchanges, um, cultural diplomacy, economic uh, access to the internal market, and that may or may not then end up into, into membership. Um, but there is also a political dimension in that that countries such as, for instance, let's name them, France, for instance, uh, they need to agree also that these countries uh, can become members and they may, there may also be uh, problems with regard to the public opinion. So look at it as a more like a trajectory. 
in sense of in, in, instead of looking it, at it from a, a zero or a one point of view, there are many possible realities in between. But nevertheless, from a strategic point of view, it's, it's not so good that there are external powers vying for power in the European neighborhoods. With regard to cobalt, um, yeah, as always, China looks with a long perspective to these matters. They have already diversified quite a lot their uh, energy need, also their energy need towards the future. And perhaps we forgot, and by the way, Congo is also, uh, there's a history between my own country and, 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 and Congo, of course. Um, perhaps we forgot that heart dimension that there was also a future possible in which cobalt would become quite important. Nowadays, by the way, I recently studied cobalt. The excess in the market that exists uh, is now bought up by Glencore and it is redirected to the North American markets. So um, the point that I want to make is that we more need an active strategy in terms of what are we going to need in energy transition in terms of what kind of resources are we going to need and can we set in place a diversification strategy actually to circumvent some geopolitical problems uh, with regard to the international organizations non-state actors international organizations are also reflections of geopolitics sometimes very old reflections think about the UN Security Council that's the world in 1945 uh, it's very difficult to uh, transform that institution into a reflection of today's or tomorrow's world. It might even need, need a crisis for that to happen, but they are still very relevant. Uh, international organizations, if they would not exist, we, need, we would need to invent them. Even if they do not work, uh, yesterday evening um, I had a discussion um, with, with some people uh, also sitting in the room here about, for instance, the OSCE. Perhaps the OSCE currently does not function as it should function, but perhaps what we discussed yesterday evening is the most important thing is that it's still there, that we have that platform. Perhaps it cannot function currently because of the war in Ukraine, but well, we might be needing it also uh, quite soon, hopefully. Um, and of course, um, the geopolitics change because of, of course, also non-state. Companies, companies are also vying for, thinking about this uh, Elon Musk person, who, which is, and also some others wh who are acquiring a lot of power. And uh, the question is then that fourth dimension, physical geography, human geography, spatial dimension, cyber, whether, and also the state actors are trying to grasp the cyber dome, or they're trying to grasp the Bitcoin world. They're trying to learn from the Bitcoin world and perhaps come up with the GovCoin soon. Um, so these are all relevant issues. And then the last question, which was also a very good one, uh, with regard to values. I'm a bit worried, for instance, about the current debate is that some of the conflicts or some of the tensions which there are are being reframed to serve some political agendas also in a kind of democracy versus authoritarianism, the US versus China or the US versus Russia. China. We, we have to be worried of that. Nevertheless, we can't ignore uh, that, of course, uh, the democracies are somewhat not only themselves in crisis, think about the Trump era and might return, um, but, of course, there is this bigger question uh, whether the world, as we have tried, we, the Western countries, have tried to consolidate it through uh, the Human Rights Council, the declarations on human rights, the Charter of the United Nations, uh, these basic principles, uh, codified and institutionalized them, whether these are not being put under pressure either from the inside out within the UN 
or from the outside in. For instance, think about the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, which competes with the IMF, and which has another set of values, and which operationalizes those values, for instance, in giving out money to all kinds of big projects. So it does matter. It does matter. Um, and of course, let, let me end by saying that, of course, Actually, let me say it in another way. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Paris uh, talking about energy with a group of people coming from all over the world, and there was this Chinese specialist, and he said, you Western scholars, you're also pessimistic. We are optimistic for the future, also from a technological point of view, but I think there is a kind of inherent fear in the West that perhaps we might not only that up long-term power position is gradually degrading and that we might lose what has been codified in terms of values and that is a struggle I would say and therein lies the question how do we deal with that from a geopolitical point of view now we can still do that um, and let me end by saying that yeah, the current crisis seems to be a crisis, a, a containment of China, uh, a war with Russia. But dialogue is then also important in order to try to still um, make sure that our values, democracy, human rights, uh, uh, the rule of law, etc., still also can be defended into the future. So I'm we're also going to need that diplomatic dialogue. Thank you so much. And we, we have further questions, and I need to restrain you a little bit in your yeah, answer, I'm sorry. because yeah. I have to tell you I, I ordered a table for dinner oh, afterwards. Okay. Uh, so we have to be very efficient here, of Very course. important, uh, very important. Good. Let's take a few more questions here. Good. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm my student. Uh, my name is Marina Stopfa, and I have a question uh, related uh, to the current uh, Ukrainian-Russian conflict. And uh, do you think that it's more than just a conflict, conflict between uh, two these countries? And uh, in a um, middle term, it will uh, lead to a change of uh, supply uh, routes uh, to energy crisis and as a consequence in a longer term we will see a concentration of the state interests in Europe and a uh, contradiction between the European uh, Union members and as a consequence of this the beginning of the disintegration processes in the European Union. Thank you. Thanks Marina and yeah. let's take two more questions again. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, my name is Hope. I'm also a MICE 2 student. Um, my question is about the geotechnical aspect you mm -hmm. mentioned, mm -hmm. um, specifically how you think this will reshape the relationship between different regions, particularly between Europe and um, Asia and Africa. Particularly in mind, I have um, the Chinese Belt Road Initiative and the European Global Gateway as a response to each other. Mm -hmm. Let's have one more question, yes. Good evening, and first of all, thank you so much, Professor uh, Krikimans, for your presentation. I'm Loran, I'm an old student from uh, Professor Krikimans, and I'm currently working for the International Organization for Migration. So my question is not so much um, a question, but more a thought, um, and shouldn't come as a surprise, it will be on migration. Uh, so, during your presentation, again, I was making a reflection, everything you say, natural resources, war, uh, human resources, um, how you link it to geopolitics, you can also link it to migration. And I was wondering, like, how in your book do you approach migration? How, how can, you know, from a geopolitical perspective, how, how can we explain migration, which I think actually is, is everything you, you discuss now has a huge impact on migration flows. But on the, from another perspective, one can also say we have those demographic trends, uh, fertility rates in, in, in the, the West are, are declining. Um, at the same time, uh, in the global South, we have actually the opposite. We have in the West our, our labor needs that we have to somehow fill in. So we also need migration. And, and from a, 
I don't know, from a geopolitical point of view, how do you uh, approach migration and then what is the impact on uh, migration and the other way around? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, I think we, we leave it there and then we have another round uh, for questions. Yes. Mm. All right, shall I go? Um, um, the, uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, I had, did not have a lot of opportunity, of course, in, in my talk, but of course there are in uh, Russia many different schools of thought. There is the Kozirev doctrine, a former minister of foreign affairs in the 1990s who believed in the westernization uh, 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 strategy. There's the nationalists uh, movement, but one of those schools of thought is the neo-Eurasianism, based on, on this idea of the heartland, etc. Et and I, I read a lot in the past about neo-Eurasianism, and yeah, after a while, I say, okay, what am I reading here? It's not relevant for what I'm doing here now. So I, you put it away, but it seems as though if we want to understand what how Russia, so the mental maps, the cognitive geopolitics, how is Russia looking, how, how did we end up in this war? Why did Putin decide to, to, to intervene? Then you inevitably end up with neo-Eurasianism and um, this idea of a, of a systemic, they believe in a systemic crisis. So do not say war in Ukraine, say systemic crisis and you could even these neo-eurasianists they believe that the systemic crisis with the west was inevitable so you could say they've now caused it on their own terms and they believe that uh, by the way um, a few days after the invasion so the invasion is to 24th of february I believe it was on the 27th of February, there was this news item on RIA, the Russian International, the, the, the Russian Information Agency, briefly for 20 minutes, a pre-prepared statement saying the war is over. So, of course, they thought that it would go very fast. The war is over. Uh, from now on, Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia will act as a single geopolitical unit. And when I read that, I was saying, this is neo-Eurasianism, this is a specific perspective. You create a systemic crisis, and out of that systemic crisis comes, if you will, a new Russia. Lavrov said in Antalya, we are fighting, we are fighting for the place of Russia in the world system. Another reflection of this idea of, of course, if I use already demography, for instance, Russian demography is gradually going down. Eh? Economy, oil, natural gas, not, not very well diversified. Will they indeed still be relevant? And apparently some, some have come to the conclusion that this crisis is needed, to create a kind of bigger, still relevant Russia that can act as a single geopolitical unit. So I think we're in a kind of, we seem to be in a kind of uh, Cold War 2.0 crisis. And even if I may go further, in their analysis, the West will buckle because the public opinion will buckle under the stress of inflation rising energy prices, the public opinion will perhaps in six months go to the streets and perhaps even other people will be elected. It didn't happen in France, of course. But mm. that's, that's the prism through which I now am a bit forced to look at, to try to explain why has this decision been, been made. And of course, you know that there have been or there are still perhaps uh, links, financial links between some political parties, uh, let me say, in Europe and the Kremlin. So this, I, I think this I'm now using to try to understand uh, the current situation. With regard to the, the question by Hope on the geotechnical, it's not an easy question because it covers so much, diff so many different aspects, of course, Europe, Asia and Africa. 
I believe a few things. Uh, the resources are going to, to become important, what I already stated. We're going to need, in, in 10, 20 years, we're going to need a whole different range of natural resources that will reconfigure world politics. It will reconfigure the economic aspects, the geoenergy, and in the end, the geopolitics. Africa, much more important than it was in the past. We forgot Africa. We as Western countries in this sense. And of course, linked to that, um, there is a, an interesting author which you may know, uh, Parach Kana, who uh, wrote about uh, the supply chains. Uh, it, it's not so important whether you occupy certain territories, but whether you can use it, whether you can use supply lines. Um, think about his Symbolism is Sing Singapore. Huh? So the, the networks that you have and how you activate those networks and the partnerships that you develop. And quite interesting, the national state is not necessarily the level to do it. Harbors, cities may play key roles in the future. Um, that may change geopolitics itself huh? because the national state is quite young still. Only a few, it's only around a few centuries. Uh, the, there are other levels, regions, um, and in the geotechnical, those regions that invest in uh, know how, in technology, but also in hubs. I, I come from Antwerp, so I'm more or less in my DNA is the harbor. Uh, Antwerp would physically not exist without the harbor. It's a crucial. Uh, port, uh, not only for the Belgian economy, but the, it has a whole hinterland, of course. And that harbor is also in a process of rethinking its position in that new economy that will come. So that is something we have to think about because there may be new trade barriers in, in the future. And then, Laurent, la the last question, and I'm honored to, to have you here uh, because you're a student from Belgium who's working here at uh, IOM. Um, yeah, migration is inherently, indeed, as you already said, it is an inherent uh, geopolitical topic. Human geography, it's, it's, it was already there in the approach by Chelen in 1899, was, was a second dimension to study. Eh? The groups of people, the nations, which may be organized around language or around a common history or, or something else, and they play a, a major role. You mentioned the fertility rates or, or labor needs. That's indeed all very relevant. And of course, seen from a geopolitical perspective, yeah, the Western economies are going to need input yeah, from... Uh, from abroad, and this may also be an opportunity in itself to connect the, f the very fact that our, uh, this institution is a very international institution, our societies have changed, have become very international, that's a strength, I would say, um, which I think we, we will be needing in that future world uh, that is coming, with all its challenges which we discussed this evening. Great, wonderful. So let's have our final round of, of questions, and uh, I would then also like to add some questions from our oh, yeah. um, Facebook uh, stream, so that we really have technology also entering uh, geopolitics. Um, but let's have some final uh, round. Anybody who, who had a question and was not yet um, able to ask? Good. So then let me, let me give you two last questions. Um, so the one question from, from um, um, the Facebook stream would be, um, what about legal rules as a geopolitical factor? Um, Ukraine had a visa regime with the European Union, um, which allowed free travel and uh, through experience as a diplomat in Russia, but also Southeast Europe. I know how important a liberal um, visa regime is for ordinary people. And the second question would be that the path to peace lies with um, sincere detente. Um, is this um, a workable solution in the various hotspots in the world? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the people uh, uh, watching the live stream. 
Yes, of course, uh, legal rules uh, do play a role. There was even, I uh, remember in, in the 1920s and in the 1930s, some research about uh, after the League of Nations was created, of course, and, and this attempt, uh, this idealism versus realism uh, debate, this attempt to codify, as I already stated, uh, within international law, um, uh, certain problems, economic problems, uh, access, access to markets and others. Uh, but of course, if you look at the, uh, for instance, uh, Ukraine, uh, the legal frameworks are quite important. Now, I am myself not a specialist with regard to uh, visa regimes, but let me uh, flip the question a little bit to ask your, your attention for uh, perhaps a, a perspective which we forgot. The Ukraine crisis, if you really analyze it from a historical point of view, uh, you have the Maidan crisis of 2014, but something, something happened before that, which is the attempt at coming to association agreements in 2013. You remember that it was Yanukovych, the pro-Russian uh, president, who did these negotiations and he flipped around and then he went to, to Putin. But I think that with regard to reg legal regimes, we in the European Union made a bit of a mistake in the following sense. We offered Ukraine access to the internal market. We offered Ukraine 610 million euros to implement the acquis communautaire in terms of legal framework, the European standards. But they had to choose our legal system. The European Union does not recognize the Eurasian Economic Union, which was a rivaling project by Russia, of course, to create a bigger market. Kazakhstan was in there, Belarus was in there, but Ukraine was crucial in that project. And you could say that Ukraine was put forward with a an almost impossible uh, question. Either they chose the EU and the European standards and everything that comes along with that, or they would choose the Eurasian Economic Union and their standards. And I have had the, um, uh, the opportunity to go, thanks to Belgian diplomacy, by the way, uh, to Moscow, and we went, we went to on a, with some Belgian academics uh, to discuss these matters. And it was actually a, a former Belgian EU ambassador, actually a commission uh, representative, high representative, who actually um, reminded us that, of course, yeah, because of these vying legal frameworks, yeah, the Ukraine, well, we set up the Ukraine for a choice, they had to make a choice. There are no um, real diplomatic relations between the EU and the EEU, the Eurasian Economic Union and the European Union. They do not talk with one another. And we came out of that uh, mission with one recommendation, one several recommendations. What well, one very Belgian recommendation was: could we not think about? trying to integrate the standards of the EU and the EEU at a very technical, low politics level, for instance, in Ukraine, so that Ukraine becomes a geo-economic meeting place instead of a place where two models are vying with one another. And I think we have to take that one with us for a potential future, because there's still this matter about how are you going to come to, at a geoeconomic level, to that east-west relationship? And how are you going to try to find some solutions? And Detente, um, of course, um, I'm a bit worried that we are in this logic of, of we're in a war logic. And um, definitely at this institution, I cannot be wrong to say that diplomacy is still important. We still need to keep our back channels open, not only the back channels, but also the regular diplomatic dialogue, 
which is quite difficult these days because we're, uh, uh, we're sending diplomats home at a rate which is perhaps not sustainable. So having that dialogue, having that dialogue in a trajectory at a societal level even, at an academic level, uh, me meeting with my Russian colleagues, we were talking next to one another, but nevertheless we were meeting. <laughs> that, that was important. And um, I think that that is still important, uh, because let me end with, with this thought. Only then, only then will we be able to uh, create again a shared reality, and only uh, through a shared reality you can have a shared future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Wonderful. Yeah, and thanks also um, to everybody attending and all the, the interesting questions. To the students, I, I still have a list here that you can sign. Okay, I will put it on this table. Um, and and other, um, uh, yeah, other than that, uh, I wish you all uh, a wonderful evening uh, and enjoy the, what's left of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.